and float under their umbrella and provide them a service. So if you, could, if you did have access to manpower pools that they don't have access to, you could come under their contract and offer them a service. When it actually does happen, how do you respond? How do you determine the level of response that's required? In many of these disaster situations, you know it's coming, you just don't know the magnitude. You know the hurricane's gonna strike the coast. You know the flood waters are rising, expected to crest at such and such an elevation. You know a wildfire is starting in a certain area. So you have a team, almost like an insurance company, positioned in the area that can rapidly identify, we have 76 accounts in this area, we have a commitment from 37 of them to provide an enhanced service. We could probably be in a position to sell enhanced services to another 17, but you won't know that unless your people are on the ground. And maybe your people is one person. Maybe it's a branch manager, a regional manager, someone of that level. Once something does occur, you may want to send an enhanced or increased number of people on site, evaluate the damage, visit with clients, and determine the level of response that they're looking for. Now we get down to the real nitty gritty. One of the things that's gonna make any response um, critical, functioning, is communications. I don't know how many people in this audience were in New York when 9-11 occurred. Your cell phones probably didn't work because the main mast collapsed when the building collapsed. I don't know, if it, I think it was the North Tower when it went down. The main mast went down for cell phone, cell phone service in the New York area. Every cell phone was dead. But Nextel worked. I think they had sites over in New Jersey. So what we did in my corporation um, is we actually had every multiple type of communication, everyone here listed, we had available for us internally. We were a financial institution. We could not be out of touch with each other and with our clients. It's the same with security. You cannot be out of touch with yourselves or with your clients. So you have to have the ability to have every type of communication device at your grasp or at your fingertips so you can actually throw it into effect if you need it. I think I talked about this, this one before. This is the absolute, to me, the most critical. If you don't have the people, there's not too much you can do about it. So finding manpower pools. Um, if you're a small company, offering your services to bigger companies where they can, in effect, adopt your people. If you do have large regional accounts and you have to provide extra manpower, if they're gonna say to you, I need another 35 people, where are you gonna get 35 people? Retirees, people who've been laid off recently, trainees, um, going to other states, this is where you have to have uh, the relationship with the state government in effect that you can bring people in from other states. People who may be more palatable in terms of having the correct background, uh, off-duty retired police, off-duty retired military people, sources of, of manpower that can be brought in who generally understand the security function. And again, contacting whatever state you're operating in and finding out what their regulatory requirements are. Some of these actually are, are fairly straightforward and, and fairly simplistic. Upgraded first aid, powers of arrest. I think every uh, state that I'm aware of that has regulations that control private security operations have things like this. Disaster management supervision is probably not number one on a lot of states' hit parades. But it's very important, and there is a, a national standard out there which would make you much more acceptable if you're working with a state OEM, or Office of Emergency Management, or with FEMA, as an example. They have the Nas National Incident Management System Training Program. Um, it's fairly standard, fairly basic, and if your supervisory level personnel are trained in it, you'll be much more acceptable and palatable when you present yourself as being qualified to work in a disaster zone or area. I told you the story about my associate or friend in the highway patrol. How do you get there? You know, you tell everybody just jump in your car and drive. Well, that's swell. Let's say you can't drive into the area. Let's say it's been blockaded or quarantined. Let's say the roads are out, bridges are down. When you do get there, where are you gonna park your cars? How are you gonna secure your cars? Again, identifying these potential problems in advance is very important. Do you bring in chartered buses? Do you bring them in by common carrier, by train, by plane, uh, by commercial bus? Um, again, as, as picky -une as it may sound, all of these have to be thought through and be part of your incident response plan.
we always think that the, uh, the public authorities will have a, a command and control operation, which they will. But if you are bringing in excess resources and offering your services to your accounts in a, in a disaster area, it's very important that you have your own command and control. And it's, I, I hate to use the word, but it, maybe it's applicable, public relations. So it's the XYZ company um, van or trailer with an appropriate number of radio masks and your cars with your logos on the outside. People understand that you are there responding and it does provide a level of service and confidence and comfort that your company was able to get there and provide a service. Where are you going to put your people? Hotels and motels, college dormitories, um, those will probably be filled up pretty quickly. Um, you're going to get, be getting a lot of search and rescue people from a lot of states across the country. So you can expect that they'll be taken. Uh, the picture I have up of tent cities and of the RV parks, these actually were from Katrina. The tent city uh, was occupied by searchers from other states. The RV park was actually for victims. But again, the same problems confront private security. You bring in a force of people, you have to house them someplace. You can't just say, well, show up to work tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and you're on your own. You're going to have to address that issue at some point. Anybody here in the uniform business? Security officers all wear uniforms. Um, that's how people identify that they do represent some degree of authority. Having extra uniforms that actually fit people um, is, is very important. I mean, you just can't show up in a pair of blue jeans and a, and a work shirt and say, I'm security. You have to have some method or way to identify who these people are. And providing your people with the essentials will let them do their job in a more professional, professional manner. These are fairly straightforward. Um, when I get down to vehicles, fuel. You have to, how are you going to get gas for your cars? You just can't pull up to a gas station and say, okay, fill her up. You may have to drive way out of the area to get gas, or you may have to have some distribution arrangement that you've arranged for. Um, it sounds simplistic, but uh, at our company, this isn't necessarily fuel related, but we had very large generators that were able to go on any time the local utility went out, and we had massive diesel fuel tanks that had five days supply of fuel sitting in every, in every generator. We fired it up every month to make sure it worked. Anytime the local utility went down, it fired up. And if it went for two or three days in a row, an oil truck was scheduled to come and refill it. So we, in effect, were self-sufficient. So the key to this is, even though we all rely on the public authorities or existing infrastructure, a degree of self-sufficiency has to be built into your plan. This to me is sort of a no-brainer. Um, if you're in this industry, you carry a lot of insurance. It's just the nature of the game, particularly liability insurance. But if you're going to be putting people that work for you in a potentially dangerous situation, there may be issues for enhanced medical, enhanced life, enhanced accident and health insurance. Uh, you may be asking people to drive their own cars and put some type of a logo, your logo, on the side of their own personal vehicle. So making it a, an insurance arrangement so that their vehicles are protected, and if they're driving their vehicle doing your work, that there's some account of that taken into effect in your plan. Probably not areas you think of just immediately jumping out at you, but having a media plan, you won't know when your people could be thrust in the limelight. There could be a looting situation and your people are involved in stopping it. Maybe they've been injured. Who knows what could happen.